Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Reserved Investments, and thank you for joining me. In today's video, we are going to be doing an in-depth analysis of seven of the hottest markets that make up the antiques and collectibles trade. For those unaware, I recently uploaded a video to this channel entitled Investing in Antiques, an overview of five of the hottest markets in the antiques trade. That video solely looked at markets on the antique side of the equation, of which no prominent third-party grading companies exist or cater to. The markets that we talked about in that video were as follows. The market for historical documents, rare first edition collectible books, firearms and edged weapons, investment grade art, and antique furniture. In this video, we are going to be starting on the antique side of the equation, but we're going to be slowly working our way towards pop culture collectibles, but make no mistake, all seven of these categories do have the benefit of third-party grading. But as you're going to see, that doesn't always mitigate the risk of attempting to speculate or invest in these markets, especially over the long term. So we're going to dive right in, and I will warn you, if you already didn't notice, this is probably going to be a longer video than usual. This video will probably clock in well over 30 minutes. So if you want to quick stop the video, get a snack, get something to drink, I welcome it simply because I'm going to be talking a very long time to go over all of these seven collecting categories. I will also tell you, I do not edit any of my videos. I do my content in one take and I try to get it all in one take. I am feeling a little loopy because I do have a head cold and I am taking medication. So I will do my best to get through this video for you guys. But please, if I do make a mistake, if I do stumble my words a little bit here, it's because I'm filming this video well after 1 a.m. and I'm pretty much under the weather. So please forgive me in advance. Let's get right into this and let's start talking about the first collecting category on our list, which is, any guesses? The market for investment grade coins. Now this is a very fascinating market. It's one of my favorite market in, in the entire antiques and collectibles trade. If you do wanna get into this market, you must do your research. What that means is you're gonna to wanna to read this book before you buy your first coin. This book is entitled, the Coin Collector's Survival Manual, and it is by Scott Travers. You can get any edition of this book you want, but you need to read it cover to cover. This book goes in depth on the idiosyncrasies as to how the rare coin market works. You need this knowledge before you choose to invest in this market. This is not like most pop culture collectibles. For instance, if you wanna collect great video games, if you want to collect graded Pokemon cards, if you want to collect comic books, it's very easy to learn those markets and the barrier entry is quite low. When we're talking about the market for rare higher end coins, research, patience, and understanding how the market works, all that is going to benefit you. You have to have the patience and knowledge in this market before you buy your first piece. Now, the market that I choose to focus on first and foremost, because I live in the United States, is the market for U.S. coinage, classic and antique coinage. I don't do anything with coins that were minted after the 1930s. So if that tells you anything, the latest I go is coins that were minted in the 1930s. I do obviously collect coins that were minted in the 1700s, the 1800s, and of course the early 1900s. But I am a purist in that regard. I do not go after modern issues. I do not go after modern mint releases. I am squirrely, a classic and antique coin collector of US issues. I do also dabble in ancient coins. I've still been meaning to do a video on ancient coins, especially now that NGC Ancients is starting to grade those coins, but primarily the bulk of my collection is in US classic and antique coinage. I did do a video on it. My personal coin collection is valued in the six figure range and I am still adding to it to this very day. My goal is to eventually complete a type set. Um, I will tell you, the bad news about this market is 
it has really grown, especially within the last 10 years. So prices are really escalating fairly high, even for stuff that, in my opinion, should be fairly common, that should be easy to get. Prices have really escalated. If you really want to play in this market at present time, you can expect to pay between two to three thousand dollars per coin, all the way up to five, six, seven, even in certain instances, ten, twenty thousand dollars per piece that you're going to add to your collection. This is why I will tell people you have to use caution in this market. There are still some good deals to be had. You just need to know where to look. For instance, if we talk about U.S. classic coinage, if you're going after some of the more popular series, like Walking Liberty Half Dollars, uh, $20 St. Gaudings Gold Pieces, series of that nature, if you're going after any scarce dates, they're going to carry a premium. Where if you're looking for value, if you're looking for sleeper coins, you might be better off going after semi-scarce dates in barber coinage or Liberty Nickels, something that is a less popular series to collect for. Right now, there is renewed interest in Morgan Silver Dollars as well as Peace Dollars, so you really have to be careful. Depending on what coin you're going after, you may be paying a premium for it in today's market. Another thing you need to know, there are really now three top tier grading companies battling it out in this market. It used to just be NGC versus PCGS. Then if you wanted to, you could go after a CAC stickered NGC or PCGS coin. Well, CAC decided to go full-fledged third party. So now you have NGC versus PCGS versus CAC battling it out in the market for U.S. coinage. Another thing I will tell you, there is a lot of opportunity for those of you that collect coins outside the United States. The U.S. coin market has grown by leaps and bounds over the last 10 to 20 years. Markets outside the U.S., they haven't grown as much. So there's tremendous opportunity in those markets, provided you have an interest. Same is true for ancient coins. Ancient coins, thanks to NGC ancient grading, is becoming a thing but it's been slow moving. Prices have escalated over the last couple of years, but before that, that market wasn't anywhere near the market cap of, say, U.S. classic coinage. So there is opportunity there as well. You just have to do your research and you have to be patient. You have to understand how these markets work. Now, I do recommend collectors, especially if you're first to get involved in this market and your knowledge is limited, there are three auction houses I do recommend off the bat. That is Heritage Auctions, Stacks and Bowers, and also Great Collections. Those are the three auction houses I recommend at present time. There are others, but again, I want to keep this video very simple. If you're a novice, even if you're an experienced collector, I'm sure you got something out of that summary. Now, the next market I want to talk about is the redheaded stepchild to coin collecting. And that is paper money currency collecting. Now, for those of you that watch any of my past videos, you know I also am big into this market. I did do a video showing off part of my large size U.S. banknote collection, which, spoiler alert, I do have a six-figure collection of this as well because I'm huge into currency collecting. Now, an interesting trend has started to emerge in the past five years or so. It used to be that currency collecting was, as I already said, the redheaded stepchild to coin collecting, meaning most people preferred coin collecting over currency collecting. It is still like that today, but currency collecting is becoming almost as mainstream as coin collecting. If you don't believe me, if you do a price analysis of price appreciation in the market specifically for U.S., large size notes, you're going to see that prices have shot up anywhere from 20 to 40 percent across the board over the last few years, and they are not pulling back. They are actually accelerating. So I don't know if it was the video that I did on large size currency. I don't know if it was Rudy from Alpha Investments talking about large size currency that caused the spike of interest in this market, but we are seeing a lot of money flowing into this market. Now, one of the books that I recommend on this market, especially if you're just starting out and you want to go after U.S. money in particular, 
is a guidebook of United States paper money. You can get whatever edition you want. Obviously, the most recent edition is going to help you because it has the most up-to-date information in it. That said, if you are going to go after large size currency and large cards, large size currency was produced up until 1927 in the United States. 1928 started our current small size currency, which we all know and love if you live in America. But large size currency was produced up until 1927. That is where the big money is flowing with few exceptions. A lot of your large size Silver certificates, gold certificates, they are all commanding a premium in the market at present time. Now, when we talk about small size currency, all is what small size currency is. If you live in the United States and you look in your wallet and you pull out a $1 bill or a $5 bill or a $20 bill, that is considered small size currency. That is the standard size of money that is produced today. That trend started in 1928. The most popular denominations when we talk about small size currency are $500 notes and $1,000 notes simply because they are no longer in production. Those notes, as a result, in uncirculated condition, especially if they are third-party graded, they command a premium on the secondary market. Now, the two main grading companies you need to be aware of when we talk about currency collecting, concurrency grading, they are PMG, Paper Money Grading, which is owned by the Certified Collectibles Group that also owns NGC and CGC. And on the other side, you have PCGS Banknote, which is owned by the Collector's Universe, which also owns PCGS Coin Grading. There is no CAC stickering. There is no prominent company that stickers notes you have to be aware of that. There are some upstarts that tried. They never really caught on like CAC did for coins. So I will tell you, you don't have to worry about the added layer of any type of currency stickering like CAC. It just doesn't really exist in command a premium in this market. The one point of caution I will tell you, if you are going to collect banknotes, please like coins do market research. To get into this market, you are going to be spending thousands of dollars per note if you are going after investment grade material. I know there's going to be people in the comment section that are going to cut me up for saying that. I'm here to tell you as a prominent investor, as a consultant in the trade, I usually tell my clients, if you are not able to spend a minimum of $2,000 on up per bank note to invest in this market, the market is not for you. This is a market for sophisticated investors. And please remember, this is the Collectibles Finance Channel. I look at everything through the lens of financial investment. So I know there are people that watch my channel that are just collectors, and they sometimes come into the comment section and they'll say, well, geez, Sean, you're an elitist. I have a very fine 1918 $1 note that I love, and it's worth 100 bucks. That's great. I'm sure it's a great note. But if we're talking about investing, I'm not going to advise a client to spend $100 on a note like that because it's not scarce. It's not rare. Nowhere near scarce in that type of condition. So that's why when I talk about these markets, we're looking at it from a financial perspective. Now, that pretty much sums up most of the antique markets we are going to be talking about in this video, with the exception of the next market, which does strata both the antique side of this trade and the collectible side of the trade. Anybody guess what market we're going to be talking about next? It's the market for graded sports cards. Graded sports cards are a very fascinating market. Now, right out of the gate, a lot of you guys are going to hate me for this analysis. I divide the graded sports market into two equal halves. You have the vintage market and you have the modern market. Now, this is where, again, a lot of my critics are going to come into the comment section and attack me. In my opinion, in my assessment, the way that I was taught this market is a vintage sports card is 1979 or earlier. A modern era sports card is 1980 or later. That was the cutoff that was given to me. I have heard other definitions where some people claim, no, 1969 is the cutoff. 
meaning 1969 and earlier is vintage, 1970 and later is modern. Or I've even heard some collectors, investors, dealers in this market claim that it's 1989. Everything from 1989 on earlier is vintage, 1990 and later is modern. My personal assessment after analyzing this market for many, many years is I have to stick to what I was taught and tell you that my opinion, 1979 or earlier is vintage. Everything from 1980 or later is modern. You are welcome to disagree. There's a lot of disagreement in this market over that. What I will also tell you is, if you are going to invest long term in vintage sports cards, you are better off going after just that, vintage sports cards. The modern era mass produced scarcity stuff that is being put out by a lot of these companies that is solely in response to what happened during the junk wax era of the 80s and 90s. If you read this book, it explains it. This book is called Mint Condition. It is how baseball cards became an American obsession, and it was written by Dave Jameson. This is one of the best books you can read about sports cards, specifically baseball card collecting, in my opinion. You can get it fairly cheaply on eBay or on Amazon. There's probably a copy still lying around your Barnes & Noble. If you go there, you may be able to find this in the Antiques and Collectibles book section. Now, with that being said, one of the things you got to realize about this market is that when we start talking about sports cards, they are based off of real people, athletes that actually live in the real world. So if you're going to go after these items from an investment standpoint, what you need to realize is people sometimes do stupid things. People sometimes are not always good. People sometimes hurt other people. And in the world of sports cards, if your favorite player does something like that or engages in really manipulative, evil, illegal activity, it can affect the value of these cards. This is why I prominently recommend people stick to the antique and vintage side of this market. If you can afford a Honus Wagner, more power to you. That is a bona fide investment grade collectible in this market. That said, I do want to make this clear. I do know on the modern side of this market, there's a lot of easy money. There's a lot of volatility, but if you get the right card, if you open that pack, if you open that box and you find that card that you can send to a grading company, you get it, grade it in high grade, you can flip it into the market, you can make a serious amount of profit. So I don't want to steer you away from that, but in my opinion, that's more akin to gambling and speculation. I like the vintage stuff. I like the antique stuff. I do not like the modern era stuff. And again, the reason why is because the manufacturers learn from what happened in the 80s and 90s. And now all is what they did was they were all the way on the side of overprinting. Now they're all the way on the side of mass produced scarcity. They keep putting out these products in such limited numbers. It is completely ridiculous. Again, it is akin to gambling. I do not see this trend lasting indefinitely. Something has got to give in this market. I will tell you though, this market is established. I'm not going to say it's mature and sophisticated. It's not like coins. It's not like currency, but it is established. The antique side of this market, if you're going after a Honus Wagner, yes, that market is mature and sophisticated. Don't get me wrong. So you're going to have to pick your poison if you get involved in this market. But make no mistake, this market isn't going away anywhere soon. And again, a lot of the top auction companies that cater to this market, of course, you have Heritage Auctions. Of course, you have Golden. And of course, you have PWCC. Those are your top auction companies that cater to this market, among some others. If you buy right, if you hold the pieces for 10 years or longer, you have the potential to make money here. That's all I'm going to say about sports cards. If you want me to do a full-fledged half-hour-long video on sports cards alone, let me know in the comment section below, and I will consider it. I have done previous videos on sports cards. Now, continuing our trek towards pop culture collectibles. The next market we need to discuss is squarely rooted 
in pop culture collecting, and that is the market for comic books. Now, the comic book market has transformed, especially over the last five years. We're no longer in the era of stupid money during the COVID boom, where people were paying a premium for every single comic book from Eternals 1 in CGC 9.8 condition, selling for thousands of dollars for a copy of Werewolf by Night 32, first appearance of Moon Knight in CGC 9.4, selling for close to eight to $9,000 simply because Disney Plus put out a show called Moon Knight and a lot of people thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna invest in this comic book. Today, those of you that paid eight to $9,000 for a copy of Werewolf by Night 32, was it really worth it? Did you get to sit there and just hold it up in its slab in all its glory while you were watching the wonderful Disney Plus show? Because I told you guys, a lot of you guys invest in reverse. You do not buy into the hype, you sell into the hype. And this is why I wanna talk about comic books here for a minute. Because comic books are still trending. The problem is, and the market was not prepared for this, smart money is now starting to flow into this market. Gone are the days when you could argue with somebody on a collecting forum and tell them, hey, I have a copy of Incredible Hulk 181 in CGC 9.8, and there's only 145 copies of that book out there. Therefore, it's rare. Anybody who watches Reserved Investments knows that that's bullshit. A book like Incredible Hawk 181 is selling for a premium because it's in demand. If somebody comes to me through my consulting business and they say, Sean, I want to go after a copy of Incredible Hawk 181. You know what I tell them? Do not buy it 9.8 condition. Do not buy it 9.6 condition. You want it 9.2 and a 9.4 condition at most. And if you do buy that book, just know there are other books to invest in over the long term because your copy of Incredible Hawk 181 is not rare or scarce by most counts. There are better books to put your money into. Batman 227 is a prime example that I continue to bring up on this channel. Even Batman 251, which really just only has a classic cover going for it, that book, in my opinion, is a better investment if you buy it in the optimal collecting grade than that of a copy of Incredible Hawk 181. There are a gazillion copies of Incredible Hawk 181, Amazing Spider-Man 129, Amazing Spider-Man 300, Incredible Hawk 180, Tomb of Dracula 10, Werewolf by Night 32, Giant Size X-Men 1, X-Men 94. All these books are not scarce by any means. They are just in demand. What happens when you have an item that is not scarce, it is not rare, and demand falls? You still have an overabundance of supply out there, so the price drops. It craters. That's why I do not like investing in books like that over the long term. Those of you that are holding those books, I hope you know, you have to continuously keep up the breast to the market. You have to do a lot of market research because you always want to sell into the hype. So if a book like that just starts trending again, you're going to want to sell into the hype and get out of it. You can always buy any of those books that I just mentioned back at any time. All you got to do, you reach out to Dale Roberts, Greg Reese, Bob Storms, and you say, hey, I'm looking for a copy of Amazing Spider-Man 129 in CGC 9.2, 9.4. Guaranteed, at some point, if they're still actively playing in this market, they're going to get that in their inventory. It is by no means rare. If you're going to invest in comic books going forward, you got to take into account the optimal collecting grade along with the overall scarcity of the book. If you do not know how to analyze this market, you will get slapped in the face with a stale donut. The smart money is the money that wins in this market going forward. Now, I will also tell you the comic book collecting market at some point is going to face a downturn. The people that are operating in this market are Gen Xers like myself and also baby boomers. Millennials are in this market. They're not in it as far as Gen Xers and baby boomers. Once the baby boomers start dying off and Gen Xers head off to the retirement homes, this market is going to start to drop. It is not sustainable over the long term. Now, the good news is you've got 10, 20, 30 years until that starts to happen. So if you want to invest in this market, there is still opportunity provided you buy right. Now that I said all that, we're going into the next collecting category on this list, which is the market for vintage 
toys. The auction company known as Hakes pretty much has a lock on this market. I will also tell you, over the last year or two, this market grew exponentially. There's a lot of money flowing into this market. I did a video on the auction results for a recent Star Wars auction through Heritage. The prices were insane. I could not believe my eyeballs. I was ready to gouge my eyes out with a spoon. That's how insane these prices were being paid for some of these items that are literally deteriorating before our very eyes. There is a lot of risk in this market. For a quick quiz question here, for those of you that watch Reserved Investments, when I invest in this market, what pieces do I go after? Hint, it's not the card it figures. It's not the great at play sets. It's not even really any more loose figures. I go after Star Wars proof cards, whether it's Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, Empire, um, Revenge of Jedi, whatever it is, I go after the proof cards. I don't go after the figures and toys because of how fragile they are. Third-party grading does not protect these items from deterioration. These items were cheaply made back in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. It doesn't matter what collecting toy you are into. If it's Star Wars, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Masters of the Universe, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all of those toy lines were cheaply made using the same materials, plastics, and products. Whether they're carded, loose, or they're factory seal play sets. You have to be careful if you are investing in this market. You also must store these items, preferably in a climate-controlled location, away from light and humidity. If you store these items in light, they will fade. They will be prone to the elements, specifically sunlight. You have to be very careful if you're playing in this market. Look at your items. Make sure you monitor their condition repeatedly. These items deteriorate very easily. Even loose figures that are graded, they are prone to discoloration. They are also prone to deterioration. You must be very careful. You can pay a premium for an AFA graded Star Wars figure. You can buy it. You can send it back to AFA to get recased. AFA can easily send you an email and say, hey, I'm sorry, you sent this in. It was perfectly cased by us originally a few years back in AFA 85 condition. If we recase this, it's going to come back in AFA 75 or 80 condition now because the bubble yellowed or it's starting to deteriorate. This is a high risk market. There are no guarantees in this market. That's why it has become one of my least favorite collecting categories as of late. Use that knowledge to your benefit. The next market we're going to be talking about, Pokemon, Magic the Gathering, collectible card games, more specifically, graded cards. This is a highly speculative market, and every time I say that, a little Pokemon Timmy and a little Magic the Gathering Poindexter come into the comment section and threaten to attack me. This market was originated in the 1990s. We are in 2024. This market is very young. It is very speculative as a result. Notice I didn't say there's no potential here. There is potential. There is opportunity here. But compared to rare coins, compared to sports cards, compared to even vintage toys, this market is quite new. You can invest in this market and make money. I want to reassure you. But you really have to use caution. Right now, Pokemon cards are becoming an over-speculated on commodity, in my opinion, even the vintage cards. You have to be very careful what you're going after. I have people that routinely attack me online claiming I don't understand this market, and I have to sit there and scratch my head when they tell me they're paying $5,000 for a Pokemon card in PSA 10 condition, and I look at the population reports, and there's over five hundred copies of that card in PSA 10 condition alone. I'm here to tell you, you do not understand how speculative markets work. You do not understand the difference between an in-demand collectible and that of a rare or scarce collectible. This is almost like comic book collecting. Your Incredible Hulk 181 in CGC 9.8 is not rare. 
Same thing's true for a lot of Pokemon cards, especially first edition Holofoil Watsy cards from sets like Team Rocket, sets like Gym Challenge, of which there are hundreds of examples in PSA 10 condition on the census. You must use caution here. Same thing is true with graded vintage Magic the Gathering cards. If we compare the market for Magic the Gathering and Pokemon, Pokemon has the edge. Pokemon, I'm sorry to say for some of you, is more popular than that of Magic the Gathering. You have to use caution in these markets. Here's a big hint. If you are investing in vintage Magic the Gathering cards, especially graded cards, I tend to like cards where there was only one printing, meaning I like cards from sets like Legends or Arabian Nights or items of that caliber, your workshops, your Alexandrias, items of that nature where there was only one printing and they are still extremely scarce. I usually tell people, avoid the later reserve list sets. I do not like cards that came out of Mirage. I do not like cards that came out of Tempest. Now, to be fair, the Urza's block, I'm kind of split on. The Urza's block doesn't seem to be as hoarded as the Mirage block, as the Tempest block, as some of the others. But still, in my opinion, you're better off going after a highly coveted Arabian Nights Legends card, Antiquities card, versus that of a later reserve list graded card like Lion's Eye Diamond. I'm just using that as an example, or City of Traders. If you really understand the idiosyncrasies of this market, in my opinion, that's where the opportunity lies. Also know, the vintage Magic the Gathering market hasn't really been on the up and up the last few years. This market really kind of took a turn for the worst, but that means if it does ever correct, there is opportunity here. So I do want to state that in my analysis. Pokemon, unfortunately, is still trending at all-time highs. It did correct with the COVID crash, but the prices, in my opinion, for most cards, with few exceptions, are trending at all-time highs. Let me give you a big hint if you're going after graded PSA 10 Pokemon cards, you might want to look at sets like Sky Ridge as opposed to Team Rocket and Gym Challenge. Just my advice there. If you look at the numbers of cards that came out of Sky Ridge that are in PSA 10 condition versus that of sets like Team Rocket, Gym Challenge, Jungle, Fossil, heaven forbid, you're going to see Sky Ridge is actually quite scarce. Sky Ridge, in my opinion, has the edge. That's all I'm going to say about that market. Last market I want to cover is the market for vintage graded video games. Now, this market, again, extremely speculative. This market also was, I have to word it this way, allegedly manipulated. As a result, prices shot up exponentially. Myself, Carl Jobs, Path the NES Punk all tried to warn you about this. Some of you didn't listen. Some of you laughed in our faces. Some of you decided to send me death threats on a daily basis. Didn't change anything. What happened? The money dried up. The market cratered anywhere from 40 to 80% in certain cases, somewhere more. And as a result, today it still has yet to gain its high price phenomenon that was reached during the COVID pandemic when the market was allegedly manipulated. There is opportunity here, but you really need to think before investing in this market or going all in. This, again, is a niche market. The average person that wants to play Super Mario Brothers is not going after a factory-sealed game for the Nintendo, keeping it in their collection because they love Mario. That is not a realistic analysis as to how this market works. It is a type of collector that wants these items. It is not the average video game enthusiast. An average video game enthusiast would be happy just to owning a cartridge version of Super Mario Brothers for the original Nintendo, or maybe a complete box copy. They don't need it factory sealed and graded. That's why this is a very niche market. The prices that were achieved 
during the COVID highs is not realistic. It was not sustainable across the board. Please use caution if you are getting involved in this market. Another thing that is complicating this market at present time is you have three top tier grading companies battling it out. And at least one of those grading companies uses a completely different grading scale than the other two. If you don't know what I mean, you have WADA Games, you have CGC, and you have VGA. VGA is owned and operated by the same conglomerate that also owns AFA, Action Figure Authority. They use a completely different grading scale than that of WADA and of that of CGC. As a result, it is creating confusion in this market. I still have little Timmies that come to me and they go, Sean, I'm going after a WADA Games 9.0 because it's equivalent to a VGA grade at 90. That is completely false. The VGA grade at 90 is a much higher graded item than the WADA Games 9.0. If you don't believe me, compare both the grading scales. One of the very first videos I put out in this channel was a comparison of the VGA grading scale versus that of the WADA Games grading scale. And people still view that video to this day and they send me an email and they go, wow, I wasn't aware of that. Let me ask you something. Why are you attempting to invest in a market where you don't even understand the main grading companies and the grading scales that they use to grade their products? To me, it just seems like you're setting yourself up to get slapped in the face with the stale donut. Now, I do want to end this video and specifically this category on a positive note. There are people that are coming into this market very slowly. You need to realize that. A lot of people have a lot of hesitation towards this market because level-headed people listen to people like me or they even pay me for my advice. I am a consultant in the trade and they understand that because this market was bid it and possibly, quote unquote, allegedly artificially inflated to the moon, they realize that there's still a lot of risk. There's still a lot of bad money floating throughout this collecting category at present time. That doesn't mean this market is devoid of opportunity going forward. You just have to be smart, you have to buy right, and you have to understand the idiosyncrasies of this market. In my opinion, I'm going to surprise a lot of people here. If we're comparing the market for vintage graded video games to that of collectible card games like Pokemon or Magic the Gathering, I actually like Pokemon and Magic the Gathering 10 times more than I like the market for vintage graded games video games. Because again, if you just want to own the video game, you don't have to go after a copy that is factory sealed and graded. It takes a certain type of rare bird collector to want to put something like that in their collection. Make no mistake, every single market that we just cover today have some element of risk. But I will tell you, some of these markets are better over the long term than others. And a lot of you guys, unfortunately, have a bias because you have an emotional attachment to these markets. Always remember the golden rule. Whenever you choose to invest in antiques and collectibles, emotional attachment, nostalgia, and investing rarely ever mix. I'll end this video on this note. No one I know ever gets attached to a Vanguard S&P 500 index fund. I have made a lot of money on my S&P 500 index funds over the years, and I do not have an emotional attachment to them. Let that be a lesson to you guys. If you want to make money in these markets, you've got to learn how these markets work. You need to learn the risks. You also need to learn the possible rewards. For instance, I can tell you this right now, as I look over this list, some of these markets from a financial investor, looking at these from that standpoint, the risk is too great to invest in these markets compared to a well-diversified portfolio. That's why I tend to go after coins, currency, and the like. Markets like that. Because if you study the trajectory of those markets, you can see the direction that they're going and the returns that they've given investors over the years. Certain markets that I mentioned here, especially when we talk about vintage toys, most high profile investors and collectors are going to want to steer clear of that market. I'm just here to tell you. That's all I'm going to say. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And one more quick question. If you do want me to do a deep dive in any of these markets and go further, let me know 
in the comment section below, and I will consider making that video. Thank you, and have a good night.